I'm not perfect. I would never claim to be without fault. I think we all know we aren't perfect. We all have flaws. Things we've said that we regret. Things we've done we wish we could change. Hindsight always gives insight. But in the moment, it isn't always obvious. And we can be oblivious. Even when we feel like we're doing right. Doing good things. Being helpful. We can even have good intentions. Sometimes our pride precedes our better judgment. Sometimes our ego goes before our words. And we need to be set straight. Corrected. Put in our place. And that isn't always pleasant. We might even avoid it. But let me tell you. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. We need it. We need it. I need it. You need it. Because even if we want to be clothed in blessing, sometimes we must bathe in hardship, scrub away the filth of our immaturity, and step into the richness, the fullness, of what God has waiting for us. Well, good morning, New Hope Leeward. Hey, can we give our creative teams a hand for these videos? That they, they make all those in-house for us. My name is Josiah Norgan. I'm the senior pastor here at the church. I want to welcome all of you here at Coppole, those of you joining us online. We are so glad that you're here. I want to make mention of something right before, uh, before we start today. Uh, we forgot to uh, pass out the buckets during announcements, so it'll be coming around if you are holding on to your gift waiting. If not, feel free to let the buckets pass you by. I'm not watching to see if you give, okay? Like, I don't care, uh, but we want to make sure we have them around because I know some of you are waiting. So those will be coming around as I start uh, today. I'm excited about today. Uh, it's a good weekend to, to join us. We're starting a brand new series called Rags to Riches. And in this series, we're going to be going through the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. If you have your Bible, uh, you can open up to Genesis 37. We're going to be in this one uh, portion of scripture together. We're going to go through this chapter today. And we're going to follow over the next five weeks the story of Joseph from favored son to slave to eventually second in command in Egypt. Now, twice a year, we like to do uh, to go through a portion of Scripture together, whether it be a book of the Bible or a portion of the Old Testament. So earlier this year, we went through uh, Rooted and Built, went through the book of Colossians, and now we're going to be going through this amazing story, and uh, it's going to be good. I hope you brought your scuba gear because we're going deep. I know, it's so lame. Okay, but I got to say something dumb, because I can't start until I do. Okay, I want to jump right into scripture today, because we're going to cover the whole chapter, okay? I'm going to read some parts. I'm going to paraphrase some parts to keep it kind of moving along, but it's a really interesting story, and it kind of starts out, I'll give you a little bit of information, and then we'll jump into the action. So verse one, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. So let me give you a little family history uh, for Jacob. So Jacob's grandfather was Abraham. Everybody say Abraham. Abraham. Now God made three giant, giant promises to Abraham. One, you will be a great nation. So Abraham would be the father of the Jewish nation. Number two, you're going to settle in the land that I give you, the promised land. And number three, your people will be my people. I will be their God. Okay, so Abraham gives birth to Isaac. Everybody say Isaac. Birth to Isaac in his old age. Isaac gives birth, well, not him, his wife, obviously, gives birth to Esau and to Jacob. Now, Jacob is, is the father in this story. He's not going to be mentioned a lot except right here in the beginning. Jacob is also referred to as Israel because he would have 12 sons, 
who would essentially go on, and there's some other nuance in there, like the tribe of Levi not inheriting the land, and two of, uh, two of Joseph's sons being part of the tribes, but essentially he would, from his line, would come the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? It's a lot of info, but let's go, let's jump back in verse two. This is the account of Jacob's family line, Joseph, okay? So now here's the main character that we're gonna be following. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Okay, so Joseph's 17. He's not the youngest, but he's the second youngest. And he tells on his brothers, and his brothers hate him for it. If you have older brothers like I do, you had this dynamic growing up like I did. And to make matters worse, Joseph is the favorite and the favored son in the family. I relate very much to the character of Joseph being the youngest son and being my parents' favorites in the family. Everybody knows this. I don't know why anybody's laughing right now. It's common knowledge. I don't, my own mother laughed, by the way, <laughs> up here in the front. Okay, thanks, Mom. Um, <laughs> I, I'm the favorite son in the family, and I, I'll, I'll prove it to you. I'll show you. There's a picture of me and my brothers. Uh, as you can see, faces that only a mother can love, and... I do want to point out that my mom is indeed looking at her favorite uh, son, okay? They are 9 and 11 years older than me. My parents tell me I wasn't a mistake, but I don't know if I believe that. So 9, 11 years older, so we had that dynamic growing up where I would tell on them and they'd make my lives miserable. And I remember this one time, the story just like sticks in my brain. I was like 8 years old. So my brothers were like 17 and 19. They're leaving the house. They're going to get in the car pulling out of the driveway, and I run outside. I just really wanted to be one of the guys. So I run outside, and I'm like, hey, guys, can I come too? And my middle brother leans out of the window, and he goes, no, you can't come because you're a meathead. And they drive away laughing, okay? And this is what happened, okay? My, you ask my dad. My dad loves telling this story so much. I stood in the driveway at the top of my lungs. I yelled this out, and I quote, I'm not a meathead. I'm a cool guy. <laughs> I just yelled it out. And <laughs> so uh, my brothers were jerks. I don't want to give you their real names. I want to I protect their identities. So their initials are Joshua Robert Nordgren and Jason Wesley Nordgren. You can find them in Ventura, California and Arizona in the middle of nowhere. They're hiding out. If you see them, Give them a little West Side Aloha. For now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just kidding. My brothers and I, we get along really well. Don't punish them. The Lord is already doing that <laughs> by taking away their hair. Okay, so. <laughs> and he's starting to take away mine, so I'm going to shut up. Okay, let's go back. Let's go back and shh. No, no, no. Don't, don't get me started. We'll be here all day. Okay, verse, verse three. Stop laughing at my jokes. We'll be stuck here. Okay, verse three. Now Israel, okay, Israel also, we can put this scripture up. Now Israel, also known as Jacob, right, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Okay, so there was a favoritism thing going on here. It wasn't just perceived because he had been born to him in his old age and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him, meaning they couldn't speak peace. They couldn't speak shalom. Like when you would uh, greet somebody, you would say shalom. You were wishing peace upon them. When you would say goodbye, you would say shalom, wishing that the peace would stay with them. So what this means was they couldn't even do simple pleasantries with their brother. No, not even hellos or goodbyes. That was too difficult for them. Joseph was the favorite and everybody knew it. And he wore this, this ornate robe. Now, a lot of times we'll see this translated to a coat of many colors, right? Joseph's technicolor dream coat. And it's all these different colors uh, patched together. And that could be what it looked like. But there's actually a, a lot of commentators that kind of have abandoned this interpretation and scholars, and they say that they believe it was a full length or a, a long sleeved or a long coat. Now, the reason for this, if you were a worker out in the field, you got to have short sleeves to get work done. So if Joseph had long sleeves, that meant that he was not workers like his brothers, but he was management class. Whatever the coat looked like, it meant favor and it meant status. It meant that Joseph was above his brothers in the family, 
and that he would receive the birthright, the lion's share of all the family assets, which was usually given to the firstborn son, not the 11th. So Joseph is the favorite, kind of knows it, and he's a little bit kind of like I was as a kid. We see him at the beginning of Scripture. He's kind of a little bit of a punk. Okay, verse 5. Okay, it's a little bit of a punk. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to the dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brothers said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. So if you're keeping score today, that's three different times the text says that they hate their brother. Okay, and it's not hate like irritated or angry. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's sine. It's a deep loathing that they had for their brother. It means to see the person as your enemy. Okay, paraphrasing ahead. Joseph has another dream. This time, the sun and the moon and 11 stars all bowed down to him. So his father, his mother, all his brothers would bow down to him. So these dreams, we gotta understand this. The dreams are from God. God is showing Joseph what is gonna happen much, much later. But Joseph, knowing how much these dreams bothered his brothers, do you think he treasured these things in his heart? Like a true little brother, he went to tell them all about it. And even, even Jacob, even his dad, like Jacob realizes the Lord is speaking something here, but even Jacob rebukes him about the way that he is going about and telling these dreams. If you're taking notes, you can go ahead and you can write this down. Joseph starts out as a character underdeveloped by an easy life. Like, you know when you watch a movie and the per or you watch a show and the person they are at the beginning of the story is not the person they are at the end. Like, in the beginning, they're kind of dumb and, and doe-eyed and they're kind of naive. And by the end, they've been changed by everything that they've been through. His story starts out like that. He, he's a boy of underdeveloped character. Now, although he's painted as faithful and reliable all throughout his story, right here, he seems a little bit prideful. He's the favored son, and he presses into the part well. Self-centered and self-absorbed, consumed by his own dreams, and not confined by how those dreams might make others feel. Now, even if you don't agree with me, there's actually some scholars that say, no, he was, he was totally faithful. Others say, no, nah, he, he was a little punk. And I kind of fall somewhere in the middle of those two. That even if you don't agree with me and you say, hey, Josiah, I think you're reading into the text, I think we can all agree he is a boy who lacks tact, maturity, and self-awareness. Normal traits that you find lacking in the favored and the blessed and the talented. We're going to see Joseph's life get very, very difficult in a moment. And rather than God just promoting him from favored son to number two in Egypt, God is going to allow him to be demoted to slave and then eventually to prisoner before he raises him up. And I believe these trials are going to shape Joseph into the man that God wants him to be. I've only uh, been out of country one time in my life. And I went with my wife's family when I was 20 uh, to Italy. Now, all I did the whole time, all I remember is I ate carbonara in every single major city. That was the one thing I set out to do. On top of that, kind of a little bonus, we got to see priceless works of art, like things I never thought I would see, the Sistine Chapel, is incredible. It's amazing. The, I got to see the Last Supper, like the original Last Supper. And then I saw the 17-foot, 12,000-pound marble statue of David, chiseled by Michelangelo. It's massive. It's, it, it's amazing. I wanted to show it to you, but there's a little bit of problem with this piece of art. Uh, brada, how do I put this? Brada, no more pants, okay? Like, no more, all his bits are hanging out. So I had to get our creative team on it. And uh, we, we, we made it acceptable for Sunday morning. So here's King David, um, ready to hit up Sandy's with a McDonald's tray. You know what I mean? So, so, here, so here's David, um, and, and this is obviously not what it looks like when you see it, but it, it's an amazing statue. And 
I talked about this statue a year ago. And actually today, I don't want to talk about him. I want to talk about uh, the works of art that are near him called the prisoners. I didn't even notice the prisoners when I went to go see the David because he's at the end of the hall. He's all triumphant and amazing. And then there's these other works of art that are unfinished, that, that line the hallway. Never actually fully realized by the artist never fully sculpted or finished. And Joseph, if you think about it, he thought that he was David. Joseph thought that he was the David at the end of the hall, ready to be exalted and glorified and put on display by God. But before that would happen, he would need to become the prisoner, both literally and figuratively, so that God could chisel away parts of his character. Now, James says it this way, okay? This is uh, James 1, 2 through 4. He says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Okay, look at verse 4. Let perseverance finish its work, as if there is a workout that happens in your spirit and your soul and your faith when you go through trials. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We can leave that up, and you can actually read this verse inverted, opposite, and you can see what usually happens. Basically, if you don't allow perseverance to finish its work, if you're always backing out, or you're always complaining, or you're always running from God in every single tough situation, you will not be mature and complete. In fact, you will be unfinished. You will look like the prisoners where God has worked on you some, but there are other parts that you have not allowed him to work on. There's parts that will be immature, parts that are lacking in character. You're going to have some rough edges. You're going to feel stuck. These two works of art, they're they're forever stuck in these blocks, in the same position, not because Michelangelo chiseled it that way, but because they are unfinished. God uses our trials to work on us. I'm not a masochist. I don't enjoy pain. In fact, I am probably the biggest complainer of all. But I can look at my own life, and you can too. I would encourage you to do this. I can look at my own life, I can look at my own faith journey, I can look at my own story, and I can see that my trials have shaped me more than my blessings. I can look back and I can see that the moments where I felt like my muscles could not go on and yet I did, those are the places that I grew the most. I have found that my prayers of despair have shaped me more than shouts of praise because my need has driven me to the one that I need over and over and over again. And when it's done, I wish I was really good at learning lessons in the middle of the trial. Sometimes I don't learn until it's done. But I have found purpose in my pain and I have even seen purpose spring from my pain as the sculptor shapes me. And see, God isn't just chiseling away my old self but he's bringing out my new self. The way Michelangelo saw it, it's so interesting, is this big piece of marble that he makes the David of, rejected piece of marble. Now, if you and I tried to chisel something out of it, it'd probably look pretty terrible because what you and I would do is we would try to chisel the block into the image. But Michelangelo could already see the image that was inside the block. And so what he would do is he would relentlessly chisel away the parts that did not fit that image. Sometimes we think that God is just taking away from us, taking away from us, just convicting us over and over again. But what he is doing, he's not just chiseling away, he's bringing out what he already sees in us. Would you say amen? Transforming us from glory to glory into the image of his son. And he does this in a lot of different ways. The chief of them, according to James, being trials. So let's look at Joseph's trial. I'm going to paraphrase a little bit first. Verses 12 through 17, I'll kind of talk through it. Joseph's brothers are gone. They're uh, grazing their father's flocks near Shechem. 
Now, Israel, also known as Jacob, sends Joseph to go check on his brothers. And I imagine how that conversation went. Go check on those dummies. I want to know what they're doing. See if they're messing around. And so Joseph sets out to find them. 50 miles this kid has to travel by himself, only to find out they're not there. They're in Dothan, another 14 miles. So this was a multiple day journey, maybe the furthest he's ever been from home. And here's where the story takes a dark turn. It says this, so Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan, but they saw him in the distance and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other, come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that ferocious animals devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. These, these cisterns were these, uh, it was hollowed out of rock or in the ground with plaster poured in. It would collect rain during the rainy seasons to be made available during the dry seasons. The plan was, we're gonna kill him. This is how much they hated him. This is built over years. We're gonna kill him, we're just gonna throw him in the cistern. Verse 21. When Reuben, so Reuben's the oldest, heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into this cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, so he walks up thinking it's like any other day. Maybe they'll sneer at him. Maybe some won't say hi, but he walks up like any other day. So when he came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe the ornate robe he was wearing. They took him and threw him in the cistern. The cistern was empty. There was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. So this, this is a, a, a brutal scene. And we get a little bit more information about the text much later on. So Genesis 42, verse 21, this is decades later. The brothers are recounting and repenting of what happened. And the brothers say this about Joseph. We saw the anguish of his soul when he pleaded with us, but we would not listen. So it gives you the image that they ambush him. Ten brothers surround him, violently tearing off this robe as Joseph pleads for his life, probably through tears. They rough him up a little bit and throw him into a cistern where he is probably still pleading and banging on the walls as his brothers sit down and share a meal together, probably with an earshot of their brother, which is almost more cruel than just killing him and ending his life. They leave him in there to starve. Paraphrasing a couple more verses. So they sit down to eat Ishmaelites or Midianites, scripture says both, uh, which were distant cousins of theirs on the way to Egypt. Now Judah has this idea, what, what good is killing our brother? Let's make a little bit of coin and let's sell him, verse 28. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern. So Joseph probably thinks, okay, the ordeal is over. They're gonna give me back my life. Pull him out of the cistern and sold him. Price of a common slave, 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. They take his robe. So sin always has a, uh, sin has a way of multiplying itself, right? You commit one sin and then you have to commit more in order to cover up your original sin. That's what the brothers do. They take the coat, they dip it in goat's blood and they bring it back to their father and they say, we think our brother was maybe mauled by a wild animal. Jacob mourns and says that he will mourn until the day that he dies. Okay, here's the last Last verse in the chapter. It says, Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard. And, and that's where we actually are going to pick up next week. But there's a little more we're going to go through before we end today. You can write down this point. God is more concerned with our journey than our destination. Now, don't get me wrong. The, the destination matters. It does. Him being brought to Egypt mattered. This is where the Jewish nation would grow and flourish and thrive before being brought low into slavery, then rescued by God through Moses, led into the wilderness, then to the promised land. We know where the story connects from there. The destination matters, but God cares more about the journey. If Joseph went from favored son to second in command of Egypt, 
without the valley, I think there would have been large parts of his character that would have been missing. He'd be incomplete. And if I were to be really honest with you, and I feel like I, I, I always try to be very honest with you, I don't really want the journey a lot of times. I get so consumed with the destination. When I don't feel like I'm in the right place or I feel like things aren't working out for me, I immediately become like, remember that needy ex-girlfriend that you had in high school that always thought something was wrong with your relationship? That's how my prayers begin to sound. God, are you mad at me? Do you still love me? Remember girls like that? Some of you married her. Okay, so, <laughs> okay sorry. I'm so sorry. Don't beat me up after service. Okay. Um, <laughs> that my prayers become like, I think God's mad at me or punishing me. I can become consumed with the destination where I am currently, what I feel I deserve, how I feel like things should be, how God should be doing his job right now in my life. I get so consumed that sometimes I miss the journey, what God is doing now, the sculpting, the chiseling, or rather what he is bringing out of me. God is more concerned with the journey, who you are becoming, rather than where you are right now. I know you're in a hurry. I am too. I'm in a hurry at all times. God's not in a hurry. And if you look at scripture, yeah, we read it as a couple chapters, like, oh, this happened and this happened, and then the person was here and they got here. Decades go by. Years and decades sometimes go by before they receive the promises that God made for and made to them. And we're gonna see, we're gonna see Joseph get taken to a distant land, and that's where we're gonna pick up next week, get taken to a distant land, and we're gonna see even in a distant land that God is still with him and God is still blessing him. I'm excited for this series, and I believe it's timely in, in, in a lot of different ways, but here's one reason why I feel it's very timely. Anytime we do these prayer times together, so we did it a couple weeks ago, we have you text in your prayer, we put it on the screen. I love that you at home, like you get your whole church praying for you. You here in service, you get the entire body praying for you. We're going to do that more often. But every time we do it, I know you feel exactly the same way I do. You look at all those things up on the screen, and at first you probably feel like, oh, good, I'm not alone. <laughs> like, I'm not the only one messed up, okay? Like, I'm, I'm not the only one going through it right now. And after that first feeling of relief, because a lot of times we feel like we're the only one going through it, I know you look at the list and you just get sad. The things that you're going through right now, the things that our family members are going through, the things that our island and, and nation and world is going through right now, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And so this story, it's so timely because Joseph is an example to follow. If you want to know, how do I be faithful in the middle of my trial and my circumstances? Look no further than Joseph. But Joseph is not just a good example. I don't think we just need feel-good stories right now. The story of Joseph is a reminder that God's hand is over every single minute and every single moment of your lives. Would you say amen to that? Every moment. The highest highs and the lowest lows and whatever place you find yourself sitting or grieving in right now, that God is there whether you are with him or in a distant land. He is present when you don't see him. He is good when life is not and I believe the entire story of Joseph, it can be summed up in this one verse. In this one verse, I'm gonna give it to you now, even though it's at the end of the story, but really it's gonna be an anchor verse for this entire series. Joseph arrives at his destination. The journey is over, he's at his destination, second in command in Egypt, and just like he, just like the dreams he had, his brothers are all bowing before him. That must have felt good for a moment. And his brothers thinking that they're gonna take, that he's gonna take their lives, his brothers beg that he would just make them his slave. Just make us your slave. Joseph reassures them and he says these words, very simple sentence. We can put it up. And I want us to read this together, nice and loud. Ready? Go. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Now let's wrestle with that for a second. 
does that mean that God caused the brothers to harm him, to get him to Egypt? So God was the one, he's the puppeteer pulling the strings on the brothers who are beating him and selling him just so God could get him to Egypt. No, God could have gotten him to Egypt in any number of ways. You see the way that Joseph says it. He doesn't say, God caused you to harm me. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. Okay, so that means this. It's probably something some of you have wrestled with before. Maybe some of you haven't. We're going to end with this kind of really giant thought, and I want you to kind of wrestle with it throughout the week. Okay, so that means this. According to the story, the scripture, that God does not cause evil, but yet he allows evil to exist. Okay, so it's two competing truths that you have to receive at the same time. And if you don't fully understand it after this, that's okay. Honestly, I don't either. Like, I'm gonna do my best to explain it in theological terms, but it's something you're gonna have to wrestle with. Because to say, so God does not cause evil, yet he allows evil to exist. Because if you say that God causes evil, then you're putting his character on trial. And God is all that is good and pure and right. But to say that God does not allow evil, to say like, well, he doesn't really like it, but it just kind of happens out of his reach, that's to put God's sovereignty on trial. And to say that God really doesn't hold all and he's not in all and through all, that he doesn't really reign over everything. So does God cause evil? No. Does he allow evil to happen? Yes. And I don't fully understand it. And it gets even harder when you have to apply it to something in your life or somebody you love because God allows broken things to happen, and I don't fully know why. There are things that have happened in your life, there are things that have happened in other people's lives, and you cannot reconcile it. There are things that happen in our world that are absolutely heartbreaking, and we might not fully understand it. And if we wrestle with it enough and kind of threaten to harden my heart at times, God does not cause evil, yet he allows it to happen. So as we wrestle with those two truths, there's one thing that you and I have to know. If we wrestle with the things we don't fully grasp, we have to grab onto the things that we do understand. There will come a day, we don't get it now, but there will come a day in which we will get it. There will come a day in which we will see things clearly. There will come a day in which those that we watched waste away from sickness and cancer, we will see them whole and healed. There will come a day in which you will walk into heaven. You might have a couple questions for God. But as you scoop those people up in your arms, you're probably not going to have any more questions. As scripture says, as he himself wipes every single tear from our eyes, as you and I live in a city, scripture says, without walls. Why is there no walls? Because there's no threats. There's no evil. So does God allow evil to exist? Yes, but the clock is ticking. And there will come a day in which he will not tolerate it any longer. And for now, the place that we're left is not only that, because I don't want you to get stuck in, well, okay, everything sucks here on earth, and I just got to look toward heaven. I just got to do that. I just got to get there. Because there's a promise for us right here in this story of Joseph. You can write down this last point before we get ready to pray. God can bring good out of the worst circumstances. You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He can bring good. Why do I say can? Is it dependent on him? No. Is it dependent on the circumstance? Only if it's kind of bad things, but not super bad things? No. I say can because a lot of times his ability to bring good out of any situation, it is dependent on you and I. Our God is not wasteful. He does not waste pain. He does not waste suffering. And if we allow him to, he will use it for good. Why? Because his hand, his guiding hand, his sustenance is over every single thing, everything. And I want to start the series there and I want to end service today there. So would you bow your heads with me? And and here's what I'm going to ask you to do, whether you're here in person whether you're watching uh, from home or in the car, wherever you are right now. I want you to just bring to the surface, what's the thing you're struggling with most right now? 
Sometimes we treat church like morphine. It's this place that we go to just kind of escape everything going on, and then we got to go back to our lives after. But I want to tell you, God does not just meet us here in this space. He meets us there too. Church and religion is not an escape from our feelings. It's not an escape from our trials, but it's where we embrace it as God embraces us. Bring to the surface of your heart what's on your mind when you go to bed? What's on your heart when you wake up in the morning? Is it your marriage? Is it your finances? Is it your kids? Is it your parents? Is it, is it somebody that you have a strife with right now? Is it in your own mind? Are you depressed? You don't even know why. Maybe the things that once brought you joy before don't bring you joy anymore, even the things of the Lord. What's going on? Big or small, would you let it rise to the top of your heart? God sees it, God knows it. I want to pray for that. Lord God, as it says in your word, we will remain confident in this. We will see the goodness of the Lord. We will see your goodness. For everything that is on the top of our hearts right now, God, you know it's there. And I pray this wouldn't be the only time we bring it before you. I pray that you would make yourself known. I pray that you would show up, that you would do miracles and change things in a moment. And while some of us wait, I pray that we would see you. I pray that we would look for you. Some weeks we don't look for you until we get to our green chair and start singing again. That's not why you saved us. You want full custody, God. You don't want just weekend visiting rights. And so I pray that we would look for you, Lord, and I pray that you would show up, show us your goodness, show us your grace. The fact that we're breathing right now, that our heart is beating, that's grace. Whether we want to be here or not, that is your grace that we are still here. Make yourself known. We trust you. Even if we can't see what's in front of us, even if we don't know what's going to happen yet, would we just walk out today with this blessed assurance that you know what? Everything is going to be okay might be longer than we want it to be, might be more difficult than we want it to be, might be brought lower than we want to be brought. But in the end, Lord, in the end, whether this life or the next, it is going to be okay. You are good. We trust you. Our lives are better in your hands than our own. We love you, God. We love you. And we pray all this in the matchless name of Jesus. And we all say together, church family, amen. Can we thank the Lord this morning?